right, I'll get started. We have uh, we have a very distinguished speaker today that we that we brought in all the way from Schultz uh, <laughs> across the quad here. Um, our Department of Physics and Astronomy's chair is Dr. Lynn Kaminsky. Uh, she has her uh, a physics and chemistry bachelor's degree from Brandeis. Um, she did her PhD in physics at MIT. And uh, she came to the Bay Area through UC Berkeley in the space sciences lab, uh, where we were um, fortunate that she was looking for a job in the area and ended up um, finding a work here at Sonoma State. She um, has continued with collaborations basically around the world. Uh, but, but starting a, a whole new arm at Sonoma State University. She's uh, founded in 1999 the Education and Public Outreach Group here at Sonoma State, uh, which has really improved formal and informal uh, education in the sciences. She's brought in over $22 million in grants to Sonoma State University. Um, a lot of her work has been in space science missions. Uh, she likes and is very proud of her chemistry and her physics background uh, and, and tells the story and told it again today of how, how she felt like some of the faculty here would, would be worried that she wanted to come in and teach all the astronomy courses. And she said, no, I'm a physicist, um, to paraphrase. Um, but of course, she's done a lot in space sciences and in um, uh, the extreme portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that means she's worked on, um, as a scientific co-investigator, on the Fermi uh, Space Telescope, SWIFT, New Star, and she has started our, our rocket and satellite programs that we here have here at Sonoma State. If we look at her history, there's a, a history of excellence, meaning that she's garnered plenty of awards very locally at Sonoma State University, um, she won um, the Excellence in Scholarship Award, and before that, uh, the Outstanding uh, uh, Professor Award for her teaching. Uh, she, she can really uh, do it all, as they say. Um, she, is a, 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 she was an American Physical Society, our, our uh, physics um, professional group. She was a Woman Physicist of the Month a, a couple of years ago. She's a, a prestigious... Um, a, a, the Association for the Advancement in Science, the AAAS. Um, she's a fellow of the AAAS, a very pr prestigious honor. But very recently, she's won three awards. And I sent this out in the email list. But I think there's, there's just a real um, outpouring of affection and, and understanding of what Dr. Kaminsky has done for the field broadly in education and public outreach, and of course, very locally here at Sonoma State. But very broadly, the American Astronautical Society, the, gave her the Sally Ride Excellence in Education Award. The American Astronomical Society, and I am an astronomer, so, so that is my professional society, uh, gave her uh, also the Education Prize. And recently, um, the CSU has awarded her the Wang Family Prize. Um, Recently, she began work, um, this is many years ago probably now, but she began work moving beyond the electromagnetic spectrum to that of gravitational waves, um, as we'll see in this talk, something that was purported to be another way to observe the universe. And of course, um, she has the very exciting results from that right now. Uh, so she has been working with the scientific collaboration of LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, uh, to seek out, to, to develop the technology to study these waves. And uh, she was the, one of the faces of this project at the recent announcement, which she is going to share with us today. Let's give a really warm welcome for our very own Dr. Lincoln. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Scott, for that very nice introduction. I am here speaking on behalf of the LIGO and the Virgo scientific collaborations. Although these discoveries were not made with Virgo, a lot of the work is done in common between the two collaborations, and so I have Virgo listed here as well. And so I will be talking to you today about the discovery of gravitational waves from merging black holes. That was reported a little more than a month ago now at a press conference in Washington, D.C. 
Okay, now this worked before. Okay, now of course it's not going to work. Interesting. I know. This worked when I tried it in my. Nope. Yep. All right. So let's start off. I hope that this is going to work. Um, interesting. I'm going to check the volume. We have detected gravitational waves. We did it. So, that's exciting. All right, I think that was just too much for my computer to handle. Or maybe a gravitational wave just uh, passed through here somehow. But that was Dave Reitze, who's the head of the LIGO laboratory at Caltech. And he was making the announcement at the press conference, which I was very happy to be able to go to. So this was held at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. on February 11th. I was going to be in D.C. anyway for a different meeting, the AAAS meeting that Scott alluded to before, so I just came a day early. But what's the big excitement? So why are we so excited that we discovered gravitational waves? Well, first, let me remind you about something that should be a little more familiar, the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So this is all the different kinds of light. And I've spent my whole career up at this end studying X-rays and gamma rays from space the most energetic forms of light. And the things that I've studied with the X-rays and gamma rays, for the most part, have been black holes, neutron stars, which are the collapsed cores of stars, things that blow up, like supernovae and gamma ray bursts. But all of these exotic, energetic objects make the highest energy forms of light. Oh, now it's working. OK. So now let me also remind you about the gravity that hopefully the physics majors in here have learned about in their classes. So here's Newton's view of gravity. According to Newton, gravity is a force between two objects. It obeys this equation here. This should look familiar to anyone who's taken first semester uh, physics, either with calculus or without. And so the force depends on the masses of the two objects, m1 and m2 divided by the distance between them, which is r, and Newton's gravitational constant that sets the scale. And of course, the apocryphal story that goes with this is Newton is sitting under an apple tree, and an apple falls down, and he's looking at the moon. And he realizes that the same force that got the apple to fall to the ground is the force that ha has the moon orbiting the Earth or the planets orbiting the sun. But more importantly, in this view, the Newtonian view, this force is transmitted instantaneously. OK, so there's no delay time. If something changes, the other body over here should feel that force right away. OK, a little, little review of black holes here. So black holes are famous, or maybe infamous, for not letting light escape once the light gets too close within a certain radius, which we call the Schwarzschild radius, or the event horizon. And that is shown in this figure right here. So here's the calculation of the Schwarzschild radius. It's basically for something that has the mass of our sun a distance of 3 kilometers. So really small compared to the size of our sun. This is a Newtonian calculation that is basically arrived at by equating the escape velocity to the speed of light as you get near a massive body. So once you get inside of that radius, you would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape, which you cannot do with the laws of physics as we know them. So that defines this event horizon around the black hole. Now, the first black hole I studied for a lot of my career in x-rays, and it was called Cygnus X1, or it still is called Cygnus X1. It's in the constellation Cygnus. It was the first x-ray source to be discovered in that constellation. And it is orbiting a supermassive star. And so here's a little cartoon. So here's the supermassive star. That's a, a normal kind of star that's burning nuclear fuel in its core. and 
some of that material gets sucked off by the gravity of the black hole, goes and swirls around the black hole and falls in. And right before it falls in, it can make x-rays. And so I first started studying Cygnus X1 when I was at a job in between college and graduate school, where I was analyzing data from the very first x-ray astronomy satellite, which was named Uhuru. And this was at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And I just thought it was incredible that somebody would actually pay me to study black holes for a living. I was a big science fiction fan. So I decided that I would go into uh, x-ray astronomy when I went back to graduate school, but it would be good to learn some more physics. And the way the mass of Cygnus X1 is determined is by looking at the motion of the star it's orbiting around. So as the two stars go around each other, the black hole tugs a little bit on the big star and makes it move around the common center of mass. And so this is what astronomers call the radial velocity curve. And you can get the mass of the black hole from that. So you can analyze the data and figure out the mass. And it turns out to be 16 plus or minus 5 times the mass of our sun. And that is pretty typical for all of the binary black hole systems that we've seen um, using x-rays. But only one of the objects in the system is actually the black hole. The other one is a normal star, either a really big star like this one, or they can actually be small stars the size of our sun, which get torqued around a lot more by the black hole. But in all cases, 16 is pretty much the largest black hole mass that we have inferred from studying Oh, probably 30 well-known systems at this point in our galaxy. OK, so now something that you might not be quite as familiar with, as explained here by one of my many Einstein dolls in my collection. It turns out that Einstein's image is um, controlled by an advertising agency in New Jersey. And so you don't get to see very many different pictures of him. You see the one with his tongue sticking out. You see the one on the bicycle. That's about it. So, they can't control me to take pictures of the dolls that I own, so I have several different Einstein dolls here <laughs> that you'll be seeing. So this one is explaining special relativity, which was the theory that he put forward in 1905. And it applies to objects that are moving at a constant relative velocity. The two big points from the special theory of relativity is that the laws of physics should be the same for every experimenter, and that the speed of light is a constant. And for those of you who have taken third semester physics, hopefully this looks familiar. This is the definition of the interval of, of space-time in which you have the differences in distances in three different dimensions, plus this term, which is the, the difference in the time coordinates as measured in your two different frames of reference. But for those of you who haven't taken this, the point I'm trying to make by showing you this equation is that for the first time, space and time are intertwined. You can't separate out space and time, so we call it space time. Right? If you travel really fast, time slows down a little bit. Right? So we are now actually all traveling at the speed of light, even though you may think that you're sitting still. Okay? We are traveling at one second per second through time. Right? As we are sitting still in space. Okay? But if you start to travel faster through space, then you start to travel a little slower through time. Um, always obeying this law that energy and matter are equivalent is Einstein's most famous equation, or the one you're most likely to see on a t-shirt. So E equals mc squared, right? We can turn energy into matter and vice versa. Well, in 1916, there's another one of my dolls, Einstein came out with the general theory of relativity. And this is not something that we tend to teach at the undergraduate level. But I'm going to try to explain it a little bit anyway. So this equation is summarized with what's called Einstein's equation. This thing on the left, which is the, the curvature tensor, g mu nu, is equal to 8 pi. This is the same g that was in the Newton's gravitational equation. This is the same speed of light. 
And then this tensor over here is the stress energy tensor, T mu nu. And if I were to translate this into English, I would just refer to the, the famous translation by physicist John Archibald Wheeler, space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. So the general theory of relativity applies to situations where things are accelerating. Okay, so you can be moving in a straight line and changing speed, or you can be moving in a circle and going at pretty much the same speed, but the fact is you're changing direction all the time, so that is considered acceleration. Acceleration means a change in the speed or a change in the direction. So if we were to look at Einstein's equation a little bit more, the stress energy tensor contains all the information about the particles and their motion, and the curvature tensor, of which this is a representation, contains all the information about the curvature of space-time. And so there's four dimensions. And in flat space where things are not curved, these diagonal elements of this matrix, because tensor is just a fancy way for it to say matrix, would be 1, 1, 1, and minus 1. And so then you would get the equation back for the interval that I showed you. But anytime you get different values for these numbers, or you get different values for these numbers than zero, you have a situation where space is curved. And so it's very complicated to solve these equations. You can solve the Einstein equation for special cases like a black hole that's not rotating or a black hole that is rotating. But as soon as you start to add other particles or other objects to the space and have more curvature, you need to solve them with equations, with the numerical equations on computers. And in the case of really complicated situations, you need supercomputers. And I'm going to be showing you some of those solutions. Okay, so let's just turn the lights down. This is not actually a movie, but this is an illustration of the curvature of space-time for a more massive body like our sun and a less massive body like the Earth. You see it doesn't make that much of a dimple in this two-dimensional representation that we call the fabric of space-time. Now, in reality, when, you, when people look at this, they think, oh, well, somehow space-time must be like this rubber sheet, because we're always using the rubber sheet analogy, and it just is indented and curved where the masses are. That curvature represents the masses. But that's not really true. We can't actually draw a picture in four dimensions. So what we do is we draw a picture in two dimensions and we get rid of a couple of the other dimensions. But in reality, space is curved, like if this was a mass, space is curved in, you know, on all the sides of the mass, right? It's in a whole spherical situation there. We can't draw that very well, so we draw this instead. But don't be confused, it's really still a four-dimensional situation. And the more massive something is, the more curved space-time is. Okay, so let's just recap here. This is Newton versus Einstein, um, summarizing the, the two different ways of looking at, at gravity, the two different ways of mathematically describing gravity. So for Newton, space was flat, time is constant. For Einstein, space and time are intertwined. They're entangled. For Newton, gravity is a force between two masses. For Einstein, gravity is just the curvature of space-time, and it can be due just to one mass all by itself. All you need is one mass to make curved space-time. For Newton, the force of gravity is instantaneous, so if something changed with this mass over here, this mass should feel it immediately. Not actually possible, um, because in fact, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, which can be derived when you solve those complicated equations of the, that come out of the Einstein equation with the tensors in it. And for Newton, light traveled in a straight line. And for Einstein, light is following the shortest, shortest path through curved space-time, which means that it will curve if it is traveling through curved space-time. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So now, electromagnetic waves versus gravitational waves, the subject of today's talk. Both are traveling at the speed of light. Both are transverse waves. 
Okay, so for people that have taken physics, if the, if the electric field is, is oscillating in this direction and the magnetic field is oscillating in this direction, the wave is going in the third direction. That's what a transverse wave means. They are produced by the acceleration of charged particles, and the primary form of these waves is a dipole form because you have plus and minus charged particles. So even if you take one charged particle and move it, and it was positive here, and then you moved it up to here, this part is now a little bit negative because it used to be positive. And when we detect electromagnetic waves, otherwise known as light or photons, we are detecting their energy. We can detect the energy of individual photons if they're X-rays or gamma rays. And that energy that we detect falls off like one over the distance squared. So if we go two times further away, we get four times less energy. Now for gravitational waves, there's a difference. Who, who can tell me the difference between mass and charge? Um, physics students only, not the, not the professors, right? So if we have these two different kinds of charge, plus and minus, and we have an, an equation, that Newton's um, law that has the force equal to the, the constant and the two masses divided by the distance squared, there's another equation for charge that has that, in, and what, what equation is that one? Do you know? All right, we know. Coulomb's law, right? And so we have Q1, Q2 over R squared in a different constant, right? But what's the fundamental difference between mass and charge? There's two kinds of charge, positive and negative. There's only one kind of mass. Okay, so if you just have one mass, that's not enough to make gravitational waves. You need to have something that breaks the spherical symmetry of that mass. You need to have what we call a quadrupole moment. And that has to change in time. Okay, so a simple way to make a quadrupole moment is to have two masses orbiting around each other. Okay, that will make a distribution that can generate gravitational waves. Another way to do it is to have a spherically symmetric thing like a star, but have a bump on it. And if that star is rotating around, that bump will destroy the spherical symmetry and you can make gravitational waves that way. Another way is to have something blow up and have it blow up in a non-spherically symmetric way. Okay, so these are all possible mechanisms to generate gravitational waves. And with gravitational waves, they are transverse, but they're more like sound waves in that what's happening is time is getting compressed and then time is getting, or space is get, space time is getting compressed and then it's getting stretched as the wave goes through. Almost like a sound wave compressing and stretching out the air that it moves through. And so we like to use the analogy that electromagnetic waves have let us see the universe, but gravitational waves can let us hear the universe, because they're more like sound waves. And it's, and it's an even better analogy than that, which I'm going to get to in a minute, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So what did we know before LIGO? We knew this. We knew that there was indirect evidence for gravitational waves. This is Russell House and Joe Taylor, and he was his graduate student. And back in 1974, they discovered a system with two neutron stars that were orbiting each other. And so that's called the binary pulsar system, and this is its telephone number here. That's where it's located in, in space, in the sky. Um, each of these has the mass of about 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And they got the Nobel Prize for dis making this discovery. And Taylor then later worked with Weisberg to come up with this curve, which as you can see has now been going for 30 years. One of the neutron stars is a pulsar, which means it's sending out pulses of light, radio light in this case, every 59 milliseconds as it orbits the other one. And so you can use those clock signals to measure the orbit of the two pulsars going around each other. And they have done that over 30 years. And this curve shows the prediction from general relativity of the rate that the orbit should be shrinking, the size of the orbit is a function of time, because energy is leaving the orbit due to the emission of gravitational waves. And the error bars on these data points are smaller than, you can, than the points. I mean, you can see it basically just exactly follows that line. 
So this was considered extremely strong evidence that gravitational waves really existed. But that's not the same as saying, seeing the waves themselves directly, which is what LIGO was designed to do. Okay, so this video, when we turn off the lights, shows you an electromagnetic view of what happens when two black holes merge. So before I start it, and this is all done with supercomputers. This is not an animation. This is a direct calculation using full Einsteinian general relativistic uh, equations. And lots and lots of computer time. So here's the black hole. Here's the black hole. They are distorting the star field behind them so that you can see some of the stars behind them and come in front of them. And now I'll start the video. And you can see how they continually distort the field of the stars behind them as they get closer and closer. And then they're going to start to merge here in a second. So if your eyes could see these, you had a really incredible telescope, which we don't have telescopes that are that good. This is what it would look like to you as they merge. OK, so now they've merged into one big black hole. And then it sort of rings and settles down for a little bit. Now let's look at the same thing from the gravitational wave point of view. This one's really hard to see on this projector, but I hopefully you can see the two little black holes going around each other. Now as these green bands start to come out, these are the gravitational waves. And they will get brighter as the waves get stronger. And the waves will get stronger as they get closer together and start to orbit each other faster and faster. And right at the merger, they get to be the brightest. And then it spins down. And you see this big pulse of waves go out. Everybody see that? Do you want to see it again? Yes, please. OK, let's, let's just do that one again now that you know what to look for. OK. So, so there they are. You can start to see some faint waves as they approach each other. And then the waves will get brighter. OK, now you get this big burst of really bright waves right as the merger event happens. OK, so now a little bit about LIGO. This one. Yeah, this screen, this projector is really very dim. Maybe we just keep the lights off one a little bit more. So yeah. here's a very simplified version of how LIGO works to detect the gravitational waves. So before I start this, OK, so it's an interferometer. So the I in LIGO stays for, starts, stands for interferometer. Let me just, I don't know which one is going to come out of. OK. So a laser beam comes out, goes through a beam splitter. Half of the beam goes to one arm. The other half of the beam goes down the other arm. That was supposed to show a gravitational wave passing. Now it'll do it again. Now you can see the actual waves traveling down each arm of the interferometer, coming back again, recombining at the beam splitter. And then here's the photo detector. Normally, before the gravitational wave passes, the interferometer is tuned so that the waves exactly cancel each other. But when the gravitational wave comes by and stretches one arm of the interferometer while shrinking the other arm of the interferometer and vice versa, the waves will start to interfere constructively and you'll see brightness on the screen of the photo detector. Okay. So then you see the waves come through as, as the space-time stretches and compresses the two different arms of the interferometer. Want me to show you that one again, too? We'll do that one one more time. So first it's just showing the beam splitter and then the waves recombining. And now here's a greatly exaggerated gravitational wave going through, stretching and compressing the two different legs. Now we see it again with the actual waves. Down, down the different arms, bounces back again. They recombine at the beam splitter. And see how they're exactly opposite each other? That's the way the interferometer is normally set until the wave comes through and changes the lengths of these arms, in which case they can go into phase 
and back out of phase and make brightness and not so brightness on the actual photo detector as the wave passes. Okay. Now you can now we can turn the lights back on. So LIGO has two different observatories. One and I've actually been to both of them. I was on the LIGO program advisory committee for three years from 2007 to 2010, giving them advice about their education program. And then when I got off the advisory committee, I immediately joined the collaboration. It was sort of like the Borg. They just assimilate everybody that comes to give them advice because it was just so exciting. And it was my kind of science. It was black holes. It was stuff blowing up. And I thought, wow, here's a, a different way for me to study this kind of science besides with x-rays and gamma rays. So one of them is up in Hanford, uh, Washington, in the, in the big nuclear waste dump up there. Um, very desolate areas, like 600 square miles are pretty much nothing, where they have all sorts of um, nuclear waste stored and have made various nuclear ingredients. And the other one uh, is in Livingston, Louisiana, in the middle of a forest where they're constantly chopping down trees. So not such a great site. I wouldn't have picked a site where they're constantly chopping down trees because the LIGO detectors are so sensitive that they can detect trucks driving by or the tree. If the tree falls in the forest, they hear it. So Hanford has a little bit better signal to noise because it, there's not a lot going on here except for occasional trucks driving by. Um, but it's really important to have two different sites because that way you can get two different measurements and by putting those measurements together it improves your confidence that you have actually really detected something. So they are on the graph here. Here's Livingston and here's Hanford. They were about 10 milliseconds apart at the speed of light going across the surface of the Earth. And this little red and this little blue, you can see they're, in, they're going in different directions. Okay, so the arms of the interferometer are oriented differently by like 90 degrees. That's important. Okay, it's another important check. So what did they just, so LIGO was first started to be built in the early 1990s. And it ran for about 10 years. And then they turned it off and they embarked on a whole series of hardware upgrades to produce what we now call advanced LIGO, which is what was used to make the discoveries. So these are some of the things that they fixed and improved. So the laser that makes the beam to start with went from 10 watts to 200 watts. The test masses, which are the masses that are hanging at the end stations that bounce the laser light back towards the beam splitter, got much heavier and much bigger. They got a lot of the noise out of the system by changing from hanging the masses from steel wires to these fused silica fibers. And there are actually four stages of pendula that are there to damp, to damp out any seismic noise or ground vibrations before you get to the, the big heavy masses that are hanging at the bottom. The readout method used to use an external beam to help it read out. Now it uses itself. So that's the homodyne part of the, on the photo detector. The seismic isolation has been improved quite a bit. So you can get down to slightly lower frequency gra gravitational waves now. And the bottom line here is the strain, which is the amplitude of the gravitational wave, the change in length of the arm divided by the length of the arm, four kilometers, has gone from around 10 to the minus 23, and it's going to be up to 10 to the minus 24. But you'll see what they, they never really did that well with that one, because there was a lot more noise. OK, so here is, here is an actual cartoon layout of what it really looks like. So here's the higher powered laser. Now, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing are all 
standing wave cavities. So for the physics students in the audience, you've all learned about standing waves, right? If you have boundary conditions and you have mirrors at each end, the waves that will fit in that cavity have to ha have an integral number of half wavelengths. And so this concept of standing wave cavities is used to clean up the signal in a lot of different ways. So this one is called the input mode cleaner. It cleans up the original signal coming out of the laser beam to get rid of side beams, side bands to make it as pristine of a single frequency laser beam as you can have. Then it goes into this system, this next set of standing wave cavity mirrors called the power recycling system. And what that does is the laser beam comes in and it bounces around in the system for a long time until you get a lot of power, a lot of power built up. You can see the little power numbers here. This thing has stopped working. Um, so it comes out at about 5.7 kilowatts. Um, sooner or later, it, it does let the power back out. And then it goes to the beam splitter. So there's the two arms, totally not to scale, because this is four kilometers long now, these two arms. And each of these arms are what's called the Fabry-Perot cavity. And for people who know about Fabry-Perot cavities, they have a finesse of 450 which basically means that the beam bounces back and forth between those two mirrors 450 times before a little bit of it can come back out. So you get this standing wave that builds up in there that keeps building up and building up until you have even more power. And then a little bit gets read out, comes back to the beam splitter, comes down to the, are you back? No, nope, totally dead. Comes back to the, um, signal recycling mirror where it builds up again, cleans up the frequencies. Finally, one more standing wave cavity again, the output mode cleaner, um, cleans up the frequencies some more. And all right, it's back, I think. Oh, no, now I changed the thing. OK, and then finally to the gravitational wave readout. So the goal was to lower the noise by at least a factor of 10 compared to initial LIGO, which then allows you to search a thousand times more volume of space because the amplitude falls off like one over the distance, not one over the distance squared. So factor of 10 improvement in the signal, 10 in each dimension, you get a thousand times more space. Oh, this, um, this thing up here is the quad suspension with the big mirrors at the bottom that are at the end of the, of the two arms. Okay, so the top two stages of the pendula, a couple pendula, are actually active servo controls that get an external seismic signal and damp it out. And then they're passive controls just from these silica suspensions. It's like the thinnest little pieces of glass you can imagine holding these incredibly heavy, massive mirrors. But the whole idea is that anything that would shake the whole system that shaking won't be transmitted down into the mirrors. Okay, so it's something like a factor of 10 to the 7 reduction in seismic noise by the time you go through all of the four stages of these suspensions on the end, the, um, end test masses. So that is really one of the, the big improvements that they made. Okay, finally, we're up to the data. So here is what LIGO observed, and, and hopefully you're going to get to hear it as well. So Livingston saw this signal, and now notice this, this entire piece of data is only about 0.2 seconds long. Okay, and their strain is on the vertical axis. The peak strain is about 10 to the minus 21. And here is what Hanford observed. Now, remember I told you that they were separated by about 10 milliseconds if you shoot a laser beam across the Earth between the two of them. So light travel time, about 10 milliseconds. But if, it, if the wave is not coming across the Earth, but coming from the other side of the Earth, the time delay at the two different sites will be a little bit different. In this case, it was 7 milliseconds. And you can use that time delay to give you an approximate direction in the sky of where the signals came from. And then also I told you that the two interferometers were pointed off by 90 degrees. So you have to rotate the signal so that they're both pointing the same way. 
Okay, so then when you do that, and then you run your models to figure out what could have produced these waves, the exact same results were fit to each of these two measurements independently. Okay, so they rotated them, they time shifted them, but then they fit the parameter models for the black holes separately. That's the curve that I just drew on top of there. Okay, they got the same results for both of them. And this is a really strong signal. And it also looks exactly like you would expect from two black holes. Notice it's getting faster and faster. And then they merge. And then it rings down a little bit. Just like the drawings I showed you. So this strain measurement of 10 to the minus 21, right? So strain is the difference. The change in length of the interferometer divided by the length of the interferometer, 4 kilometers. Okay, maximum strain 10 to the minus 21. That says that the change in the length of the interferometer is only 4 times 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's really, really tiny. That's like 4 one th times 10 to the minus 3 times the size of a proton if you decide the size of a proton is 10 to the minus 15 meters. It's like measuring the width of a, of a human hair over the baseline to Alpha Centauri at four light years. It's an incredible measurement to make. And you wonder, well, how the heck can they measure something that's smaller than an atom? But what they're really measuring is these, the phase shift averaged over this entire mirror of this very, very bright beam. And so if you count how many atoms there are on the face of the mirror, and then you do the calculation, it isn't quite so ridiculous sounding. But it's a pretty amazing accomplishment. This is the noise curve um, for the two different interferometers at the time that the detection was made. So they were sensitive to gravitational waves between 20 and about 1,000 hertz. Obviously, this is the sweet spot down here. This is the best strain. All these spikes are known resonances in the system, which you can correct for and remove when you're doing the data analysis. But if you go back to looking at this, you can see these frequencies, right? This is 0.2 seconds. You can see the peak, the fastest it moved was about 150 hertz, the fastest frequency. And the analogy to sound is that our ears actually can hear those kinds of frequencies as well. So we can take this pattern of the waves and translate it into sound waves, and we can listen to what it would sound like. And notice how it gets a faster and faster frequency, higher and higher frequency. Well, that is what people call a chirp. So now I'm going to play the chirp for you. In the real frequency that it's at, it will sound more like a thump. But then... We're going to shift it 400 hertz so your ears can hear it a little better, and it'll sound a little bit more like a chirp. So, and then you'll see the waveforms um, go through. Okay, so did you hear that? You hear, it sounds like a chirp, right? It goes whoop, whoop at the end, and so. This other way of looking at the data, the colored lines for the two different detectors. So here's the waveform the way I showed it to you before. Here is the, basically the amplitude of it um, versus the brightness shows the amplitude and the scale on the left shows the frequency. So you can see how the frequency gets higher as it gets brighter and then it just stops. So all the action of the merger really takes place in less than about a tenth of a second, right? Because that whole waveform that I was showing you is two tenths of a second. So I'll just do that one more time because I, I love listening to it. So this is the normal frequencies. This is shifted now. Okay, so, so we have these two interferometers and... They're like, they're like two ears, right? There's like two ears, one in Hanford and one in Livingston. Well, with just two ears, you can't tell very well where something is coming from. You would like to have a few more ears, a few more microphones around to detect signals. 
Oh, this I just had to show this because my wonderful artist, Dora Simonette, did this, which is now too dark to see, um, did this wonderful picture of the overlaid um, waveforms with the electromagnetic versions of the merger in spiral merger and then the ring down. And this was the astronomy picture of the day on the day of the press conference. And so we were so proud because they, they, they had us do that and, and then the image got put in all sorts of places, including a cake at the LIGO meeting I was just at last week. And Aurora said it's the first time she's ever been published on a cake, so she was very pleased. I took a picture of it and sent it to her. Okay, so, so now what we do is we use these general relativity numerical codes and we run models and we fit the models to the data and we see what could have made a waveform that looked like this. And so these are the results of the parameter fitting. This is the final mass, it's what we call the chirp mass, versus the final spin of the black hole system. Came out to about 62 times the mass of our sun. Then these are the individual masses over here. So one black hole versus the other black hole. So one black hole was 36 plus or minus, you know, five or four. The other black hole was 29 plus or minus four. Add that up. See how much mass you get when you merge them. You can figure out what the energy was that left the system for the merger event in gravitational waves. And it was about three solar masses worth of energy were being carried away in that wave, which is a huge amount of energy. And then you can figure out the distance by seeing what the amplitude was, and you can figure out the spin by the fit. That's the distance in redshift terms. Um, so that's this other fitting. And, and as I said before, the two individual detectors gave the same answers for the, for the masses of the black holes in the system. Now this is pretty amazing. I don't know if you're as amazed as I am, but I was really amazed because I have been studying black holes my whole life. And the only ones we knew about were in systems with regular stars. And they all weighed about 15, 10 to 15 solar masses. So there's a lot of firsts here in this slide. So besides the first gravitational waves, it's the first time we've ever seen evidence for a binary black hole system with two black holes that would have come from stars. And both of them are much bigger than any black hole mass we had ever measured before with X-ray data or gamma-ray data. And I'm not counting the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies because that's a whole different story. Right? Those are millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. We don't know how they get made. And we have seen a couple where it looks like there might be two of them in the center of a galaxy. But we had no proof that there would be stellar mass black holes that would be this heavy, that they could be in a binary. They're not likely to give out X-rays or gamma rays any kind of electromagnetic radiation because there's no matter around them. There's just black holes. It's just pure space-time curvature. So, so that was amazing to me that, you know, we have the best proof that there's black holes in binaries. They're heavier than any black holes we'd ever studied before. They made the gravitational waves. This is about um, 1.3 billion light years away. So this event happened 1.3 billion years ago. And came to us just, you know, in time for us to be turning on the detectors and get everything working. And people have been writing us and asking, don't you think that's really too coincidental that, you know, you turn on the detector and all of a sudden you see this thing? But we had no a priori expectations for how often these merger events would happen because we have not seen a single one electromagnetically. So there were, there were no expectations. We thought we'd see some merging neutron stars, which make short gamma ray bursts, something I've studied for a long time. And those would, because the neutron stars only weigh 1.4 times the mass of our sun, the total chirp mass being 3 instead of 60 would be much weaker signals. So we were thinking we'd have to pull the signals out of the noise, and we would have to do lots of computer analysis, and maybe we'd be lucky and we'd see a short gamma ray burst at the same time, so then we would have more confidence in a result. But no, this thing just came blasting in, and you could see it in the raw data. And, you know, it fit the models perfectly. And so it was just truly an amazing, amazing first event. And then, as I said, you use the, the, the arrival times of the two different detectors to get a pretty lousy position on the sky, um, limited to about 600 square degrees. So you have no idea. You know, we're in the mostly southern hemisphere, but there's a little tiny banana up there, too, that it could have come from. So 
people have tried to do electromagnetic follow-up with all sky detectors like the gamma ray burst monitor on Fermi, and they did actually see a little tiny blip about 0.4 seconds after. And it might have something to do with it, or it might not, because, you know, you can't prove it with a positional coincidence. It's sort of an okay temporal co coincidence because there's no expectation as to what the electromagnetic radiation should be doing. So, you know, the paper's being published. It's intriguing. We'll have to see if we see any more of those for, for future gravitational wave events. I'm not sure. But we're not done yet because this was just LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. The Virgo detectors in Pisa, Italy are three kilometer long and they are being upgraded right now and should come online hopefully by the end of this year or sometime in 2017. The geodetector is very short, probably not ever going to be sensitive enough to help, but if something happened in our galaxy, like a local supernova, they would have a chance of seeing that. We got approval to take the extra set of detectors that used to be at LIGO Hanford, where they had also a two kilometer setup besides the four kilometer setup, and give them to India. If India would pony up the money to build all the infrastructure, all the vacuum lines, all the control centers, all the computers, they could have a copy of the hardware that's being used in LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. And we were negotiating with them for a while, and then we were getting very close to getting them to agree, and then we announced the discovery, and then the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of India tweeted immediately, we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so like two days later, they got the approval and it went through their Congress, not a big surprise. So. And then Kagra is also being built now in Japan, and it's underground system, and it's cryogenically cooled. And so they're hoping to both the cooling to lower the noise in the electronics and the mirrors, and the underground to lower the seismic noise, um, they're hoping that that, that makes them competitive and, and reach the same kind of sensitivities that the two LIGO um, observatories are doing. So if we had all those other microphones, we would be able to get much better positional limitations if they got detected by a bunch more places. Now, obviously, what we really like is one in Australia. And we tried, before we went to LIGO India, we tried to offer, the, make the same deal with the Australians, but they didn't really have the money, although they have a lot more physicists there that know about the detectors. But they, they didn't have the money. So we're still hoping that, that maybe someday we'll be able to build something in Australia because that's much more southerly and would help a lot with triangulating the position from the different, the different places. And so I will end with the gravitational wave equivalent of the electromagnetic spectrum that I showed you in the beginning. This is not the only kind of gravitational waves that we have. Okay, there is an entire spectrum of gravitational waves that can be created, just like there is an entire spectrum of ele electromagnetic waves that can be created. We are here with LIGO looking at the fastest periods with the shortest baselines. Four kilometers is a pretty short baseline compared to space-based interferometer arrays, like was originally proposed for an experiment called LISA laser interferometer space antenna. And there is a Pathfinder mission for ELISA that was just launched by the Europeans called ELISA that's up there right now and working so far um, just to prove that you can float these test masses in a total drag-free environment. And then you would have three satellites and you'd have laser beams bouncing between the satellites over much, much longer baselines. So then you could see longer wavelength gravitational waves such as would be produced by, say, two massive black holes in the center of the galaxy eventually colliding, as opposed to these stellar-sized black holes that are in spiraling colliding. Then on the ground here, this is probably the, the cheaper way to, cheapest way to do it, um, nanograv, so pulsar timing arrays, have been funded by the National Science Foundation. You've got big radio telescopes tracking the timing of these wonderful clocks that are these pulsars, but you need millisecond pulsars, which have been getting discovered in increasing numbers because Fermi, my gamma ray satellite, has doubled the number of millisecond pulsars that people now have identified. So there's something like 70 of them now. Um, and so what you do is 
These are perfect clocks and they're all over the sky. And if a gravitational wave comes by on a time scale of years to longer, it should subtly dis disturb the timing of these clocks. And so that's how you would see the wave come through as the space time is stretched and compressed in between all of these little scattered clocks. So people are working on that right now. Um, no results yet. And then there's the primordial gravitational waves that should have been imprinted on the signal of the cosmic microwave background. And you may recall some press about this a couple of years ago or a year ago from the BICEP2 experiment. Turns out they were wrong. They weren't really gravitational waves. It was really dust. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that what they originally reported was not actually quite right. But there's still hope that by making more and more sensitive cosmic microwave background detectors, especially ones that are sensitive to the polarization, that you will be able to get some evidence for those primordial waves. So that is the story. And here's some last words from Einstein with the, one of the pictures you're allowed to use here, the bicycle picture. Um, I hope I have convinced you that we can actually comprehend uh, the universe at least at, here at the dawn of the era of gravitational wave astronomy. So I thank you for your attention, and we have time for questions. Okay, so, so the first observing run from, for LIGO started actually about officially a week after we made the big detection and went for a few months, and we are, continu we are continuing to analyze the data from that initial run. We call it O1. The instruments are turned off now. They're being upgraded and tweaked. This is a, a totally normal situation that happens um, with any kind of big science experiment that's on the ground like particle accelerators. So you turn it on, you see how well it works, you see what things weren't working quite at the sensitivity level that you expected, you turn it off, you go fix those things, you turn it back on again a few months later, and you see if you've improved your noise floor. So we'll be turning the observatories back on again towards the end of the summer, something like August or possibly September. But in the meanwhile, we have plenty of data from O1 that we're continuing to analyze, so stay tuned for any future results that might come from those data, which I'm not allowed to talk about right now. Oh, I don't know, maybe 60? There are, there are near 100 solar mass. Yeah, 60 maybe is a common... 60 is sort of star. a common supergiant type star. Maybe the very original Stars might have been 100 solar masses to leave behind a black hole that was 30 solar masses, but we don't exactly know how you do that, how you get another one right next to it, and how when one of those stars goes supernova, you don't blow the orbit apart and leave the two stars orbiting. So the theorists have a lot of work cut out for them now that we've made this discovery. Um, you could have a dense environment with one black hole and somehow another one is going to come by and get captured. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ideas, but I don't think anybody really knows. So you said that that, that very short time period, the point two, um, was when they actually merged. What is, do you have any idea what the lead time is up to that Oh, point? hundreds of millions or billions okay, of years. Okay, so that really was just... It's really, it's boom. just its last, it's okay. just the last death spiral, so. right, the burst okay. that, that makes it. Okay. Because we don't have the sensitivity to see the lower amplitude waves that would have been going on for all of those years before that. We only have the sensitivity to see the really strong waves that come out at, at the merger. Uh, how many events per year or so would you expect to see with the well, so that's a really good question, and we only have the one event that we've reported so far, and it came, you know, a couple weeks into the, the, the time when both interferometers were really working well and, and locked. And so, okay, one event in three weeks, so, you know, maybe you would get one a month, right, um, of this type. And as the sensitivity improves, you could start to see the neutron star mergers, which we know happen about once a week. To twice a week based on short gamma ray bursts. So, so would you expect a correlation between short gamma ray bursts and, and the merger of two neutron stars, not 
black holes necessarily. Right, but much weaker because the total chirp mass, the total mass of the final system is only going to be three solar masses instead of this guy, which was 60. I think I saw some. Sally. Yeah, where do gravitons come in? I mean, so, if you go to the electromagnetic spectrum, you're going to the particles, the molecules. Right, right. So, so, so that is a question that Einstein spent a lot of his life trying to figure out is how to put gravity into a quantum framework. And so you can look at the energy and you can say how many gravitons would have been produced, but we are not looking at gravity from a particle viewpoint. We are looking at gravity from a wave viewpoint yeah. when we use LIGO. Just like when we do radio astronomy, we're looking at electromagnetic waves like their waves, and when we do X-ray astronomy, we're looking at X-ray photons like their particles. We don't have any graviton detectors at the present time. Um, and this is not going to be sensitive to gravitons. So the whole question of gravitons and you know quantum gravity, that is not a question that LIGO can answer. In the back? Yeah. It looks like the, uh, the amplitude is <coughs> Oh, it looked a little bit bigger? Yeah. That's probably just within the noise. They're really very consistent, and the peak strain is about 10 to the minus 21 for both of them. But you're getting, you know, slightly different times, you know, readouts because of the different distances to the two detectors. So you might just get a little bit more of an amplitude. But they do go, you know, right on top of each other to within the expected error bars from, from the readouts. Would you like to mention the other Sonoma State connections to this amazing discovery? So, yes, I was very proud to be one of 1,004 authors on the discovery paper. <laughs> and two of the other authors are Sonoma State graduate, physics graduates. One is Ben Owen, who for a long time was on the faculty at Penn State and has now gone off to start a new gravitational wave group in Texas Tech, in Lubbock, Texas. And the other is Ryan Quitso James, that somebody here might have overlapped with. And Ryan just finished and defended his PhD on LIGO at the University of Oregon. So, and I got to hang out with Ben at the press conference. So that was really fun as well. And also at the meeting last week, the team meeting. Although I haven't seen Ryan for about two years. Although I have run into him at team meetings. So it's really exciting to be able to, you know, see students that you, that you know and then meet up with them in a professional capacity later. And that was really just a, a very nice um, event. But, but Ben was on LIGO far before I was, because Ben went off to work on LIGO for his PhD thesis at Caltech with Kip Thorne, who is one of the two people who will probably win the Nobel Prize for this discovery, the other being Ray Weiss from MIT. And the third person that the team has been promoting for the Nobel Prize is Ron Drever, who is a physicist from Scotland who did a lot of the early interferometer work when he came over from Scotland and um, got hired at Caltech. Okay, so the, the reason the waves are no longer coming out is because the black hole is merged and there's no more um, quadrupole moment, right? So you've got the time varying quadrupole moment while they're spiraling around, but as soon as they merge and it becomes spherically symmetric again, it quivers for a little bit in a non-spherically symmetric way, which is the ring down, and then it just relaxes and then it's a perfect sphere and there's no more waves. Comment. We have not so far done that unless this little blip that Fermi saw oh, 0.4 seconds later was related to this, but we don't know if it was really related to this because Fermi sees bursts every day from somewhere in the sky and because we don't know what the position was and the timing is suggestive, but it's not, you know, if we see another one and then that one also has a little blip of gamma rays 0.4 seconds later or something like that, then we'll start to believe that maybe there really is an electromagnetic connection. But usually to make the electromagnetic waves, in the case of the merging neutron stars, you need to have a bunch of stuff around. You need to have some, some material that's there that will get lit up as the blast wave hits the material after the merger happens. And so, 
Yeah, so, but if you just have two black holes, there's usually not a lot of material around. It's just pure space-time curvature, and then you get different space-time curvature when they merge, and the tension that was in the field is what's traveling away as the gravitational waves. Um, the 62 solar mass final product has a certain curvature, the extra curvature if you added up the two original ones you'd have this three solar masses left of curvature that travels away in, in the form of waves. The energy gets, gets turned into the waves and, and off it goes at the speed of light. All right, well, we'll uh, entertain questions down in front afterwards, but let's thank our speakers. <laughs>